something in the chat. I guess you're live. Okay. 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 Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to another lecture uh, of computer architecture. Today, we are going to solve some sample exam questions and answer possible questions from you. So sorry for the lateness. We have some infrastructure problem. The first uh, presenter is Atobert. He's going to solve question about DRAM latency, which was for the last year exam. So yeah, feel free to start. <laughs> yeah, so I'll just, I'll get started right ahead. So this is the DRAM latency question from last year's final exam. And it uh, basically in the first page, it talks about the configuration of the system here, and then gives us a, um, a bunch of requests that are scheduled to the DRAM device through the memory controller. And then it also tells us at which cycle, uh, what command was issued by the memory controller to serve these requests. So I'll, uh, basically I'll get started uh, by solving the first question immediately and we'll go back to this information as we, uh, as we need to. So the first question asks, what is the size uh, of a single row? So this, uh, for this, we need uh, basically this and this information. The first one tells us physical addresses are 24 bits large. Um, and the second bullet tells us that there are 1,000 uh, rows per bank and eight banks in total and in a single channel. So because we have 24 um, bits, and basically uh, the, this this also the third and the fourth bullets. The third bullet says that the DRAM is byte addressable. So every address, uh, every address, basically every the physical address will address a byte. And uh, the most significant three bits of the physical memory address determines the bank. And the following 10 bits of the physical address uh, determines the row. So we will use these four bullets here to solve the first question. And uh, because the most significant three bits form the uh, bank bits, that is bits 23 to 20, uh, or is it 21? 21. And then the next 10 bits form the row address bits, that's 20 to, uh, it should be 11, I think. And then the remaining bits, basically there are now 11 bits left in the address. So this was the bank, this is the row. These are the bytes in a row bytes in a row. So we will find the size uh, of a single row from uh, this basically, that is two to the 11 uh, bytes because there are 11 bits left for us to address the bytes in a row. Is this clear enough? So that is also two kilobytes because I mean, you already know two to the power of 10 is 124 and that's one kilobytes. And this is two to the power of 11, so multiply it by two. Okay. Yeah, the second question asks, what are the uh, DRAM parameters here uh, in three bullets? And if you can determine them, if you can determine them, uh, the question asks for uh, these timing parameters in, uh, in nanoseconds. And to solve this question, we basically need to revisit this whole uh, the, the, all the bullets and the requests that we executed. Um, I'll start by uh, forming the, basically decoding the address into bank and row bits here, uh, the addresses of the read requests. And notice that these are ordered in um, decreasing age. So the first request is the oldest request in the request queue. And the last request is the youngest one. And this is important because the memory controller uses an FRFCFS scheduling policy. That means it will try to prioritize older requests, but also won't be able to issue requests um, if, if the bus is not ready to accept the command. So we'll get to that. Um, yeah, but let's start with uh, decoding the address bits first. So I'll, to make this faster, I'll look at the solutions. 
It's on the other tab. Okay. Yeah, this one. Okay. Uh, yeah, but maybe it's here. Yeah, so these are here. So maybe I will just fetch this information. Benefits of the iPad, or maybe not. How do I copy this? Okay, there you go. Yeah. So if you were to decode um, the bank and row address bits, the, these are what you would get for the same requests. Um, this is important because uh, if, if we're targeting the same bank, we will have different latencies. If we're targeting different banks, we will have different latencies. Um, and uh, the other necessary information is exactly here. So th these are the commands that the memory controller executed to schedule these requests. Um, and then um, basically what we do is let's let's look at the activate to read latency. So the first cycle we execute a pre-charge command. This has to be, be executed by the memory controller to serve the oldest request. And the reason for that is uh, again, we prioritize older requests. And we know that at the beginning uh, of this uh, basically timeline, uh, assume that all banks are ready for a DRAM command. So if all banks are ready for a DRAM command, the memory controller must execute a command to serve the first request. And it ex executes a pre-charge command. And that means the bank three, basically, in the beginning, had a row open. Uh, so there, there was a row open, row X in bank three that we don't know. And yeah, we were looking at activate to read latency. So this is this piece of information will become useful later on. Uh, but I, because I'm starting from the beginning, I want to uh, let you know of this earlier. And then in cycle one, we will send an activate command. And this will be sent to serve request two. So this one. Why? Because uh, um, we cannot immediately send an activate command after a pre-charge command. And that activate command must be for the second read request, essentially. So if we do that, um, then that um, second request activated bank two, right? And the read command that's executed immediately after the series of the activate commands. It is also serving, uh, it is also to serve this request that targeted bank two. And from here, we can deduce the uh, activate to read latency. Uh, act to read. This is eight cycles. And if you look at the next, uh, the differences between uh, next, um, next three uh, pairs of activate and read commands here and here, they exactly have the same latency between them. So then act to eight to read latency is eight cycles. Here, I will write eight cycles and we need to convert them to nanoseconds. Um, and for that, we know the uh, frequency. Okay, maybe I can go back to the questions here. Yeah. yeah, we know that the bus operates at 500 megahertz. So the clock period is two nanoseconds. And if we spend eight cycles, it means that we spend uh, 16 nanoseconds. Okay. And then it's activate to pre-charge latency. And for that, we will look at the the latency between um, these two. So this one, this activate command must target the, uh, it must be for the first request. Maybe I should clean this up a bit. I don't need this. Well, I mean, I think we need this, but row X was open in bank three. 
at the beginning of the timeline. And uh, yeah, so at cycle four, we send an activate command. This must be uh, the command to serve the first requests that target the bank, the, the third bank, this one. And we, we need to schedule another command to the same bank. Uh, so there's a, also a row conflict. That means we need to pre-charge the bank and then activate it again, activate a different row. So to, to do that, the memory controller will send a pre-charge command before it activates row 128 in bank three. And this is that pre-charge command because there's nothing else to pre-charge here. And the memory control applies open bank policy if you look at the bullets. Um, sorry, open row policy. That means that memory controller is not interested in closing the bank after it uh, opens it and there are no further requests that target that bank, uh, that row. So the other rows remain open. The only row it needs to, the only bank it needs to close is uh, bank three, and that is to serve the third request. And the latency between these will give us the um, activate to precharge latency. And this is 26 cycles. And that is 52 nanoseconds because our clock period is uh, two nanoseconds. And finally, we have pre-charge to activate. And for that, you can look at uh, these two, the difference between these two commands, and that is um, four cycles because we char pre-charge the first bank. And then, uh, so there are two, th two ways to basically understand this, uh, two, two things to look at to understand this. It's the, the first one is, uh, the difference between do these two commands, uh, cyc the pre-charge cy at cycle zero and the activated cycle four, and the difference is four. And if you look at here, it's the same. Uh, we pre-charged bank three and we opened row 128 in that same uh, bank, and we spent four cycles again. So this must be the pre-charge to activate latency. And four cycles is uh, exactly eight nanoseconds because Again, clock period is two nanoseconds. Any questions here? Yes. This one. Yeah. This one. Um, so if it was not targeting bank three, let's say, we would expect it to be uh, scheduled here. There's no reason to expect it to be scheduled at cycle four, basically. Um, if so, what I'm trying to say is we know that the pre-charge in the first cycle pre-charged bank three. And uh, to if there is a timing constraint that's let's say larger than three cycles, which is like apparent here, right? Um, then the the activate command that comes after that many cycles should target the same bank essentially. So if the activate command was, was sent at cycle three, we wouldn't be able to understand which one targets which, but here we assume that this uh, is, is bound by a timing constraint and that must be the pre-charge to activate latency because uh, the other timing constraint here could be activate to activate latency, right? But it looks like it's one nanoseconds. So the memory control would schedule it earlier if it was uh, bound by that constraint. Okay. Uh, what's the row buffer state? Yeah, moving on to the next question. Yeah. Okay. So this question asks, what's the uh, state of the row buffer? Uh, row buffers in every bank. Uh, basic, which rows are open in each bank? So we only know uh, a few things. Uh, we know that bank three must have some row open before we uh, before the, these requests are scheduled. So bank three is open. We also know that the other banks here, two and five, they're closed because we didn't send any pre-charge commands before sending the activates for them. Uh, so two and five are closed. And we have no idea about the rest. And these are unknown. Yeah, any questions here? Let me double check with the 
answer sheet actually, yeah. So unknown, unknown, bank two is closed, bank five is closed, bank three is open and the rest are unknown. Okay, yeah. So the last question here is uh, asking us what happens if you had a tier latency DRAM uh, design in this bank. So it says, assume that a bank consists of a single subarray. So uh, we have a single subarray in the whole bank and that subarray um, has a near segment and a far segment. The near segment has lower latency uh, in all sorts of accesses. And the, the far segment has higher latency in accesses. So this table summarizes what changes in latencies. Uh, and what it says is basically, if, you, uh, if you're accessing a row in a near segment, your activate to read latency is now uh, not eight cycles, but it's six cycles because this is the difference basically between. So you, you, you deduct two from eight and you get the new latency. If it was targeting a far segment, um, now it's eight plus one, nine cycles. So this table is telling us what happens to the latency of each request. And uh, then it's, it asks, um, basically, uh, yeah, if, if, if the same set of requests here, instead of 42 cycles, it took 36 cycles. So what is the TLDRAM design? What does it look like? Uh, meaning that which are the near segment rows? And which are the far segment rows. And it also tells us that the first n rows in the bank are near segment rows and the, the remaining ones are far segment rows. Uh, so I think there are a few things you can do here, but uh, I will start by assuming that all the rows here target the near segment rows because we need to have a lower latency now. And that the only way to do it is to at least put some of the requests in the near uh, segment, right? So let's put everything in the near segment and see what happens. That is basically we're setting N equals 192 and see basically what happens to the new latencies. And N is 192 because, uh, let me copy this again. Maybe I cannot copy it. If it's already copied, uh, the 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 request that targets the row with the highest number, uh, largest ID, uh, is 192. So if n is 192, every row is every row accessed by these requests are in the near segment. And then um, what we will do? Uh, yeah, I, I I wanted to copy this here, so yeah, paste. Mm and then paste this one also. Copy. And yeah. Um, okay. So let's look at what happens uh, when we have everything in the near segment. So these are all invalid now, except the first one It starts at cycle zero. And uh, well, this activate has to go at cycle one. Again, nothing changes uh, because there are no constraints here. Cycle one, uh, sorry, cycle two. And then this activate targets the bank that, that was targeted by this pre-charge command. Now, if this is in the near segment, um, the row that the, the pre-charge command pre charged was in the near segment, then the pre-charge to activate latency is one cycle smaller. So this should be executed at cycle three. Does that look right? Yeah. And then we have the read command to, again, this one, uh, sorry, um, to bank two. And this is, everything is in the near segment. So this will have uh, our, let me, yeah. So let me write these down. So also default latencies act to read is 
eight cycles. Um, activate to precharge is 26. And precharge to activate by default is four. So it was eight before. Now, since it's in the near segment, it is uh, six cycles. And one plus six is seven. So this was executed in cycle seven. This one's executed at cycle eight because two plus six is eight and then nine. And then we have a pre-charge. This goes to bank three. Uh, so again, in the near segment, activate to pre-charge latency is five cycles smaller. It was 26 cycles before, now it's 21 cycles and we add three, uh, 21 to three and then we get 24. And then we have the activate command to the same bank. Uh, and this should be three cycles, 27. We add six more and now we get 33. Uh, so this, we overshoot uh, the latency. Uh, so we need to put some of the rows back in the near se uh, far segment. So we basically have, if, if everything is in the near segment, we have a, a latency that's lower than what the question asks us. That's why we need to put some uh, rows in the far segment. And for that, we can, there is one trick we can do. We don't know which row this precharge command targeted. So we will put that in the far segment first. So if we do that, uh, what happens is um, precharge to um, activate for that segment will be two, two cycles uh, larger. And because we calculated with a precharge to activate latency that was one cycle smaller than the default, now we have to make it two cycles high, uh, larger than the default. Uh, now we essentially added three more cycles to this. And how, how it happened was basically instead of um, this activate command was not executed, now it's not executed at cycle three, but it's executed at cycle six. Because it's executed at cycle six, this precharge command is also delayed by three cycles. This also gets delayed by three cycles, and this one gets delayed by three more cycles. And we had the latency target that we had. Any questions on this? So it's basically, I tried to minimize the latency by putting everything in the near segment first. And then because I ended up with a smaller latency than what the question asked for, I put only one row in the far segment. And when we did that, we, get, we got the correct latency value of 36 cycles. Now we don't know what N is. We only know it's larger than 192. And uh, row X that was open is in that range, basically. That was open in bank uh, three before everything started executing. Okay, I already took a lot of time. Uh, I think we can move on if there are no questions to the next question. No questions, no questions, okay. Okay, thank you, Atobar. Yeah, you're welcome. Can I take this one, sir? No. Thanks. The next question is about raw hammer and Girai is going to discuss it. Okay. Hmm. Do I need to share again? Seems like that. Okay. Can you see the screen? Good. So here we have uh, a raw hammer question uh, in two parts. The first part is about the attacks. The second part is about defenses. And uh, there's some system definition here. Um, I'd like to highlight a few things to begin. So you can see that there's no raw hammer mitigation mechanism implemented in any part of the system. And it does not implement virtual memory. So whatever address you will see in this question is just like physical addresses. And uh, yeah, 
there are some other information we can just refer them back, refer back to them uh, when they are needed. And uh, you can see some definitions of some instructions here, uh, but these are just like self-explanatory. Basically, uh, there's an unconditional branch, there's store, there's CFLash, where it's straightforward. And I think uh, if you look at this first program here, uh, okay, you cannot see that. Maybe I can zoom in a little bit more like this. If you look at this first program here, uh, you can see that, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it might look familiar to you from the Philippine Bits papers uh, presentation that uh, Professor Mutlu did during the Rohammer lecture. So we have two memory accesses here and then two CL flush instructions that uh, basically flushes the cache line back to main memory so that uh, you'll hope to uh, access main memory and uh, hammer rows. So, okay, uh, let's check the first question. So in the first question, we say that, okay, you have this program one and uh, you run it, but you cannot observe any bit flips in the target system. And uh, you figure out that the number of activations is much lower than what you expect. So you're shooting for like very large hammer count, but when you actually probe the memory bus and see like how many activations are being performed, you only see like a few activations going on. So what might be the problem? So that's the question. Like, so the question is asking for like two potential reasons that might cause this kind of observation. And uh, there's definitely like more than one correct answer for this kind of question. As long as your answer makes sense, you will get the grade. Uh, so does anybody want to try? Sure. Yes, uh, but I think you need to elaborate more. In the same row, yes. That can be one reason, right? You can, so to, to clarify for everyone, so you have your bank, you have your rows here. Uh, let's say this is bank and this is your row. If one address is hidden here and the other address is hidden here, so every time you access the memory, you will hit the same row. So the content of the row is is uh, is going to be in the row buffer here, and you will never access the row actually. I mean, you you will access it one, two, two times, and then you will just uh, serve other uh, accesses from the row buffer. So that can be one reason. What about the second reason? So similar to this. Uh, we can also have an address mapping that actually puts this second piece of data into another bank. So in that case, uh, as you know, each bank has their own row buffer. Uh, so uh, once you access this address, for example, you will be accessing the row buffer. Once you access this address, you will be accessing the row buffer. So it's also, again, a lot of row buffer hits and there's no uh, hammering kind of access pattern going on. So another thing can be uh, you're relying on CL flush instructions here to flush your cache lines to the main memory, but maybe in that particular system you're using the CL flush instructions are uh, not allowed in the user level, maybe they're just ignored. Uh, so that can be also the case. And uh, yeah, we have a few uh, different answers here. You can check later, I think. Yeah. So yeah, as long as you provide like two reasons, that makes sense, it's okay. Mm, okay, so uh, in the second part of the question, uh, second part of the first part actually. <laughs> so it's like, uh, yeah again, about the attack 2.1b. So we have uh, three different programs in this question. And we observe that only two of these programs can induce row hammer bit Phillips, but the third one cannot. And uh, so the question is asking like, which program segment is the one that does not induce row hammer bit Phillips? Uh, so again, we have, yeah, these codes here, uh, very similar to the 
one that you see earlier. So here um, we are accessing different addresses in these three programs, if you notice. So we can just focus on these addresses and see what is different, right? Um, so here, um, if we, so this is in hexadecimal formats, right? So we need to uh, convert them to binary format and see like which address bits uh, they have. And um, uh, for that, we also need to check a few system configurations basically. But from the previous question, uh, from your answer, for example, um, we know that uh, for, for a program to industry hammer bit Phillips, this source should uh, access different roles in the same bank, right? So if they access different banks, it doesn't make sense. If they access the same row, it doesn't make sense. So let's check this out. Um, so in the question, it says your physical memory address is 16 bits. And uh, you have two channels, four banks per channel, and 60 row, row, 64 rows per bank. Uh, so since you have two channels and four banks per channel, you can actually identify a bank using three bits, right? Like one bit for the channel and two bits for the bank. So you will uh, look at like three bits in total, and then it will give you the uh, bank ID, basically. So here, um, I'm just showing the solution because it's, I, I don't want to take a lot of your time. So this is just binary representation of these hexadecimal addresses here next to them. And if you check actually which bits are common, which bits are not common uh, across these two addresses in like for each program, uh, you see that, uh, so these addresses are common here, right? So the other, other bits are different from each other. And similarly for program 2B, these addresses are common. And for program 2C, these addresses are common. So uh, since we know that in, in a successful raw hammer attack, these common bits, uh, I mean, the bank ID should be common, right? Um, so uh, we can say that, so since these three bit, uh, if these three bits represent which bank we're going, uh, did, uh, which, which bank these addresses are mapped to, um, we can see that, okay, so these, uh, uh, this program 2B and program 2C uh, can be sending the uh, uh, two, two requests to the same bank. While, so if, if you look at these bits, for example, so this is based on an assumption and you, you just build confidence on, the, on your assumption, right? So just, we just assume that these three bits identify the bank ID and for 2B and 2C, we see that these bits are common across uh, these two addresses. And therefore, they, they would be uh, addressed in the same bank. But if we look at 2A, so these bits are not uh, identical. So these two addresses can be addressed in different banks. So that's one uh, explanation, right? You can just say, okay, these three bits are bank IDs and that's why 2A doesn't work. So if you come up with an alternative solution, it's, it's, it will also be accepted as I said earlier. Okay, so um, about Rohammer defenses. So here there's a lot of text, but I'll try uh, sim uh, summarizing it. So here, um, what we do is actually, uh, we observe that um, when we run some workload on some system, uh, we observe some bit flips. And when we try investigate, uh, when we investigate like why this happens, we see a correlation of like, um, uh, when we have more activations, uh, I mean, in a, a certain access pattern, basically, we observe bit flips. And this certain access pattern happens to be, um, uh, activating a row A many times. So different from the first question, here we have a mechanism 
uh, that actually uh, tries mitigating or defending against raw hammer. So these are the um, specifications of the uh, system and the defense mechanism. So when we look at the DRAM chips, raw hammer vulnerability level, we see that uh, arrow needs to be activated at least 20,000 times. So this is your raw hammer threshold. So uh, to induce a bit flip, you need to activate 20,000 times. And uh, is there a question? Okay, I think Bono doesn't have a question. Okay, do you have? Okay. So, uh, okay, so when we look at our raw hammer defense mechanism, the behavior comes like this. Whenever a row X is activated 4,096 times, it actually triggers a defense action that actually sends a row activation commands to the row addresses X minus one and X plus one. And also from the DRAM chips characterization, we know that blast reduce is one. So meaning that uh, when you hammer a row, you induce bit flips only in the adjacent rows, not, not the other rows. So, uh, and when we look at the memory access pattern, actually uh, this uh, memory access pattern activates row A 30,000 times. So this is definitely larger than 20,000 times, right? In a 32 millisecond time window, so I think from the uh, specification, uh, we can see that uh, it's, uh, I mean, in the first two milliseconds, the victim rows are not refreshed. So that's there. Uh, and also uh, during these activations, the defense mechanism activates row A minus one and A plus one once every 4K activations target in row A, right? So, okay, you, you activate row A 30,000 times, but after every 4,000 activations, you actually send an activation command targeting A minus one and A plus one. Um, uh, so the, the overall hammer count you observe shouldn't ex actually exceed 20,000 times, but still you observe some bit flips. So what would be the uh, reason? So, okay. <laughs> Uh, any, any guesses? Go ahead. It's, it's very close, yeah. You're getting there. Yes, uh, I think terminology is a little bit uh, uh, different over there. So uh, since the system doesn't have virtual memory address space, I mean, when you say virtual to physical, it's some translation in the operating system level, right? Uh, here we uh, just say, actually, um, it's, it's a mapping ha that happens in DRAM. So it's, it's just like in DRAM row address mapping. So the reason is uh, you, act you send an activation command to A minus one and A plus one, but uh, those are called logical addresses and they might not be actually, they might be mapped to some different rows in the physical uh, layout. So you're not actually refreshing the victims as you said, and uh, therefore uh, you observe it Phillips. So the second part of this question is asking, if instead of this defense mechanism, we implement PARA, would that help? We are just like speculating here, right? Hypothetical case. So instead of like, uh, uh, do you guys remember Para? Okay, I, I'll, I'll just give a reminder anyways. So um, when you send an activation, Para observes these row activations and after every activation, it just performs a probabilistic process and with a low probability, it, uh, perform, it uh, 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 sends activations to X minus one and X plus one, um, but not based on some counter value. So here, the different thing between this defense mechanism and para is para will not track these activation count and trigger it when it reaches to 4,000, but it will probabilistically uh, trigger it. So 
would replacing this with para uh, solve your problem? The answer is no, because para would also activate these rows that can be physically mapped to some different rows. So uh, it wouldn't solve our problem. And uh, the last part of the question is would implementing block hammer, uh, so this is the lecture that it was discussed in last year. I think it is something different this year. Uh, in, in memory controllers, instead of this uh, defined defense mechanism, would it solve the problem? So as a reminder, block hammer was uh, not sending activating activations to the victim rows. Instead, it was throttling the activations targeting the aggressor row. So uh, basically it uh, guarantees that no row will be activated more than 20,000 times. So since the activation count is limited in that way, uh, even though this A minus one, A plus one, X minus one, X plus one are mapped to different rows, it doesn't matter for block hammer, it would uh, save the day basically. And that's the answer, yes. And that's the end of second question. So are there any questions? Okay. Who is the shortcut? You're okay. Thanks a lot, Giray. The next question is about processing near memory, which Geraldo is going to discuss. Hello everyone. So let's get started in this question here. Okay, so this is a process near memory question and tells you that you have two applications that you want to accelerate, application one and application two. Um, and then also give you some information about the system that um, baseline CPU system and a process memory system. Uh, we are going to get back to that here uh, at some point. And the first part asks you uh, what is the execution time of both of the applications when you're executing that in the baseline CPU and you don't need to account for the time for these first few instructions over here. So it's just the time of the loop. Uh, okay, and here um, it tells you that the CPU is a single issue in all the processor. Uh, all loads and storage are serialized, gives you the frequency of the CPU. And, and also tells you the time for arithmetic operations. Uh, jumps is one cycle. If you have to do a complex operation, it takes 50 cycles. And loading stores are four bytes, uh, loads four bytes of data. So if you look at this, four, this first loop here, uh, so the execution time uh, is going to be equal to the number of cycles that you're going to execute this loop for times the, the latency of a single, single iteration. So let's say uh, each one of those parameters next. So you can see the, the, the branch here for this loop. Uh, it, 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 it's for 1 billion uh, iterations. So you're going to execute this loop 1 billion times. So this is 10 to the nine. And then you basically just need to count because the processor is in order and, and everything's serialized. You just count how many memory operations that you have. We have uh, two loads here and one is stored here. So we have three memory operations. You have... Uh, uh, one multiplication, one addition, and one increment. All of them are simple arithmetic operations as defined here. So you have uh, one, two, three simple arithmetic operations. And you have a uh, branch, um, yes, the, the branch operation. 
And if you go back to the latencies here, the latency of the memory operation is 100 cycles. So it's going to be, uh, let me move this here. Oh, it's in Turkish. I don't know. How do I copy this? Ah, maybe I can. Ah, really good. So it's going to be, <laughs> it's going to be three times a hundred uh, plus three times, the latency of the other one was one cycle, three times one. And then the other one is the latency of a branch was also one cycle. So one times one. So this is the, the you can make the, you can do the math. Uh, usually when I'm grading, I don't care so much about uh, if the math is correct or not. So as long as, if you give me the equation correctly, I will give you the points. But if you try to do the math and then give me a wrong answer, I'm going to remove from points because I have to go to the math then. So it's better just leave it as it is so it's safer. Um, Okay, so the second application, you do the same. Uh, you check here, this is a bit different. If you look at the branch operation here, uh, the increment for this branch uh, is increments of two. So this is going to actually operate off, uh, is going to execute, is going to execute to uh, half of uh, 1 billion times. And then again, you multiply by the latency of a single operation, of a single iteration. So here we have one, two, um, where is this story? Three, multiply, so here, three memory operations plus one, two, three, four simple operation arithmetics plus. My right is discussed. Plus uh, one complex operation, this is square, and it says that it takes 50 uh, simple operations, which is one cycle, so it's 50 cycles. So one uh, complex, and this one, and the branch. So this is going to be equal to 10 to the nine over two times three times 100 plus four times one, plus one times 50, plus one times one. So there is any question here? Okay, great. So now we are going to implement a process near memory accelerator uh, for this architecture. And here it gives you some of the, of the limitations of the, of the process memory architecture that you are going to design. So you're saying here that you're going to design an accelerator in the logic layer of a 3D stack memory, which can provide your accelerator four gigabytes of uh, gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth. And, but at the same time, you have an area limitation, a, a area envelope for you to design an accelerator of a hundred millimeters square. And the clock frequency of the accelerator is going to, because it's in, in DRAM, is going to be lower than in the CPU. So it's going to be one of um, one tenth of what the baseline CPU can run. And the important part here is that the accelerator is going to consist of multiple processing elements, and each processing element is going to have several uh, functional units. And then it gives you a table here with the functional units that you have uh, available for you to execute and some description of them, and then the latency that they are going to take in cycles and also the area that they are going to occupy. And then it's saying here that the process element uh, is going to execute the same computation as the entire part of the loop. So there's no pipeline. You execute every single loop at one step of the, in the processing element. And they say here, therefore, if you have any processing elements, any iterations of the loop are executed in parallel. So as many pro uh, processing elements you have, it means as is, is the parallelism that you can extract from the loops. Uh, the loop iterations are executed on the processing elements are described by the compiler. It's not that important. And it also says here that you can, uh, you can reuse functional units uh, inside the processing element in case uh, there is no data dependence uh, for that particular operation that you want to accelerate. 
So you see here, two processing functional units can be executed in parallel if there is no dependence between the operands. So you're going to design this accelerator uh, with the maximum number of processing elements as possible that fits in the power and the area budget that you have for the ping accelerator. And then the first part asks you what is the area of the configuration of your process memory accelerator that provides the highest performance for each application fitting the process, name, process near memory budget. Uh, show your work. So usually if you see a process memory question in the paper, in the not in the paper, in the in the exam, uh, you probably I designed it. And if there is a code like this, probably you're going to have to do a data flow graph to do some computation because I really like data flow graphs. So from the start, I would already start drawing it. Uh, you don't need, you can ignore this first part here. We are all interested in the loops. Uh, how you do this? So the first, you basically need to figure out the dependence that you have uh, in this code here. Uh, if you get it correctly, you're going to get the rest of the, all of the equations correctly probably. So the first operation that you have uh, is a load and this load produces R4. And then you have another load here that does not depend on the previous one. And it's going to produce R5. And then you have a multiplication operation that is going to depend on uh, R4 and a constant. So this is your multi operation and going to produce R6. And then you have an add operations that's going to depend on R6 and R5. Um, so here is an add operation. And then you're going to have a store operation of this R6. Uh, so here we have, so here is R6. And this is a store operation. And then you have the increment. The increment, so this, the previous operation, the store still depends on the value of the increment. So that is, since there is no, register rename or, or alignment alias that you can do here. You, can, you need to wait uh, to increment the variable, otherwise you're going to store the data in a wrong position. So you only can do the ink after, even though there is no, uh, this is a false dependency. We need to respect that because there is no way to fix it. Right. There is, the question does not tell you that is, uh, you should fix it. So you have to do the ink here and then you're going to, give R3, and then you have the branch operation. So this is the data flow graph for this particular application here. And now you're going to design the accelerator for this data flow graph. Well, what did I do? Copy the wrong thing. Did I lost my data flow graph? I don't know what I did. I paste the third one. What does it mean? Ah, it's back. I, I said seal. It's not that one. Cut is which one? Ah, is this one? The first one is. Thanks. <laughs> okay, great. Ah, yeah, this is true, but it's fine. It's, it's, it's continue here. Uh, so this is your data flow graph for this accelerator. So in parallel, actually, you can only have uh, uh, this load instructions here. Everything else is serialized. So you can have, uh, we let's design it for a single processing element first. Uh, let's say that here is your, your processing element that you're going to design. And then you are going to just replicate that for the other, uh, uh, but depending on the area here, just duplicate that as much as you can to uh, paralyze the loop or to open the loop. So here you're going to have two, because you have, can do any then in parallel, you're going to have uh, two load units. And then for all of the other arithmetic units, uh, you only, they, they, can, they, they are also realized. So the multiplication, the addition is going to happen only after the multiplication and the same uh, for, the, for the increment. So you're, you can have a single ILU here because again, it's written here that uh, they, they can be reused. Uh, 
I think it's the other part actually. And then uh, this is store. So we already covered this operation here, this one, this one, this one, this one. This is store can be reused with this load because those are both load and store units actually. Yeah. Yes? Yes? No, but you cannot paralyze the, what, what do you mean? There is a data dependence right. between the two? Oh. Yeah, yeah, so uh, you do, oopsie. Uh, you do first the first two loads. So here there is a data, de yeah. So, uh, yeah, so you do the first two loads and then you do the mood. Uh, you could, you cannot move this mood earlier because of the dependency. No, There is no dependence. Then you could just move this like one time load later and then you don't need the other load for you. But then you're going to surrealize loads. You're going to increase a, you're going to. No, you're right. Ah, you're saying that. Ah, okay. I understood you're saying. You're saying that you do, instead of, you can do a load and then you do the mood. And then here you do the load again. And then you do them. And then you use only a single load units you could do that and but then there is going to come to the next question because at the same time since this is a process memory engine you want to maximize the bandwidth utilization of your memory device um, as much as you can and the bandwidth utilization that you're going to be able to achieve here since the only parallelization that you're going to have is those load units depends on how many load units you have uh, so it's it's quite important to do as many load operations as possible in parallel, um, in, in, so you can fit the the you can fully optimize the 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 bandwidth of your DRAM. But yeah, it's possible. It Would be another solution. I don't know actually if the performance would be better. I don't think it would actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But as you're going to see, uh, it's going to give you uh, exactly uh, the area of the area budget that you got before. So I think it's going to be a, you're going to probably you're going to use less area if you do that. But then you cannot put another processing element, uh, processing element for you to do the computation. So the answer that is going to give you is 25 processing element units. If you save one, uh, one uh, unit for a single processing element array, you can you can still not add another one. It's not going to give you 26 processing element units because of the total area. So you're just, okay, you're saving the area, but you're not using any, you could exploit more parallelism uh, if you use that extra area that is not uh, used to do uh, anything else, actually. It's just uh, there. But anyway, yeah, it's the implication, yes, you could do that. Okay. Um, so the LU here ah, and the branch unit that you are missing. And then that is done. So all of those four here. So, and then the, you check the area of each one of them. So if I'm not mistaken, the area is one. So the area single of a single processing element array is four limit square. Your power budget is a hundred millimeters square. And then you divide by four you can have 25 of those ones. So the area that you're going to utilize in the end is going to be 24, five times uh, four millimeter squares, which is a hundred millimeter squares solution. Is there a question? Can you fit 33 if I do that? Let me do the calculation. So it's going to be, ah, it's three actually, 33. And then you can perform 33. Yes. No, can you fit, yeah, you can fit 33 actually. Oh, this is good. Anyway, completely changed the solution, but it's fine. Uh, yeah, I guess, yes, you could further optimize this uh, if it's, it's still into it. Yeah, yeah, it's true. 
Anyway, I'm going to continue with 25 just because all of the other things are 25, but good that you guys found a better solution. And then uh, the next one is pretty much the same. You do the first load. Then you produce R5. In the second load, you produce R6. And then you do a subtraction. Then you produce R5. And then a moot operation, also R5. And then addition with uh, needs R4. Ah, it was before. And then this produce R4, then you do a, a square operation. Then the store. It's finally, branch, no, sorry, intern branch. So pretty much the same here. Uh, this time around, you cannot do that because of <laughs> there is no place to pick the other load. But anyway, this you need the two load units. Uh, so discover this one and this one. Then you have the arithmetic unit, the LU, the branch unit here, and also the uh, square root unit. So this is going to take uh, one millimeter square, one millimeter square, one millimeter square. I think the other one is uh, 30. You see one here. So the total area of this of this guy here is 24 millimeter squares. And if you do the calculation, not miss uh, wrong, it should be this. And this gives you only two of those uh, units. And then, so it means that the area that you're going to use is uh, is 34 times two, 68 millimeters square. Yeah. Any question? Okay. And then asks you, uh, are the process number accelerator between in B, capable of fully utilize the memory bandwidth of the 3D stack memory provided in application one, application one and application uh, two. So the memory that you have uh, is gives you 40 gigabytes per second of bandwidth, right? This means that you load uh, 40 bytes in, uh, in one nanosecond. Or since the frequency of the process memory unit is 10 times lower, so it, this means that you, you can load uh, 400, you need to load 400 bytes uh, in one cycle of your, oopsie, of your uh, process, name, name, process near memory engine to fully utilize the bandwidth of your device, of your memory device. Um, the accelerator that we designed before we can load the maximum of each load operation is four, uh, four bytes. And in a single processing element unit, you can load, you can, because I designed with the two one in parallel. So you can uh, load uh, uh, two operations at the same time. And you have 21, 25 uh, units. So it means that uh, this accelerator can load uh, Eight uh, times twenty-five, uh, which is okay. Is fifty? Yeah. Is this is smaller? Which is smaller than the other one? Right. 
So it means that this accelerator cannot fully leverage the bandwidth that you can provide uh, for the ping units, for the 3D stack units. And it's pretty much the same thing here, four bytes that you need to, is your, should be your target. And then you check how many loads you can do in parallel. Again, two. So it's pretty much the same, it's the same math. So the answer is no, because of the same reason. Uh, okay, so what is the speed up of the processing neural accelerator compared to the execution of the CPU baseline? Show your work. So basically you need to figure out the execution time of your ping accelerator. Uh, so here is going to be the latency of a single, uh, the latency of a single uh, iteration here is going to be, um, is going to be uh, one cycle here. So it's going to be one cycle, one my plus one cycle here, another cycle here, another cycle here, another cycle here. Another cycle here. So one, two, three, four, five, seven. So it's going to take seven cycles. And uh, we open the loop 25 times, right? So times 25 iterations. Uh, so it's going to, I'm not going to make them do the math. And then the, and then the cycle time, is uh, the CPU was uh, one nanosecond and this one is, is 10 times uh, lower, right? So it's going to be 10 nanoseconds. So this is going to be the execution time. And then you basically divide uh, the time that you calculate before. Yes, the time that you calculate before for the CPU, this one here, Yes, just a sec. By this one. Ah, I'm, I'm forgetting, I'm forgetting something. This is not correct. Yeah, yeah, I forget the iterations, yes. <laughs> Divide by 25, yeah. So now it's correct. Don't try, please. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So for just to write the equation really clearly, which was one of the things, like not as clear, like this is disgusting. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't don't try. Don't try. It's much easier to grade because then you just see the terms and like go see through. Okay. Sometimes it's going to ask like, oh, can you provide speed ups and a particular configuration? So you have to have more or less the idea of the order of magnitude of one of the other to see if it's going to provide speed up or not. But then you can see more or less, uh, uh, they need to fully calculate to get the, the end number uh, as long as, and usually the numbers are big enough that you can clearly see that it's like one order of magnitude difference from one to the other, and then you can infer which one is bigger, and, and then you can just say, ah, one is faster than the other, and then you put the equation there. Ah, Girai, I locked the screen by mistake. Trying to share to the... Thanks, G'day. Okay, great. So, because of time, it's best this divide by this one. Did you guys understood more or less how it was done? Okay, so the other one is pretty much the same thing. You come here and you count. It's going to take one cycle here, one cycle here, one cycle here, one cycle here. Uh, one cycle here, the cycle of the square root, I think is 70, yeah. 
one cycle here, one cycle here, one cycle here. So it's going to be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight times seven cycles. Cycles times uh, the latency times uh, it was ten to the nine divide divide by two divide by two again right because uh, the iterations here was half a billion yeah was half a billion iterations and we open the loop two times right uh, here no where did it is here, uh, we open the loop two times, right? So you parallelize the loop twice. So it's going to be, uh, this is going to be the execution time and then you divide by the other one for the CPU. So speed up. Yes, that's it. Is there any question? Okay, so that's all. Is the next one? Uh, hey, thanks a lot, Geraldo. The next one is uh, memory access pattern. That Constantinus is going to solve it. He will also cover the prefetching question back to back, and after that, we will have a short break. Now? Yes. So just give me a second. Yes. <clears throat> Can I zoom normally here? Yes. I'll flip this to the other one. Don't flip this, sorry. No, don't. Don't let the screen to go black. And okay, yeah, yeah, sure. Can I assume you know the question? <laughs> yes, yes, I do. I'm going to discuss uh, the fourth question, the memory access patterns and interference. Um, this is a question that it's not so hard to solve, but you need to have more critical thinking rather than doing, cal doing calculations. Um, so let's start with the definitions here. So you can see um, a graph with uh, some vertices and a compression format. We don't really care about this. We just care about uh, some specific properties of the application, of application one. So that's why I'm not going to dig deeper into that. So the application one essentially is page rank, okay? And the most important, one of the most important properties is this one, that every, every value of the data structure is a four byte value. It's an integer. That's important so that we can do our calculations. So let's dive into the application one. So first, as we can see here, we have five allocations, right? The old rank, the rank, the destination vertices, the weight and the source. And different data structures have different sizes. So the old rank depends on the number of vertices, the rank on the number of vertices, destination uh, data structure on the number of edges, the weight data structure on the number of edges and the source data structure on the number of vertices. So what the application is doing in the beginning, it's somehow it's doing some uh, initializations for the data structures. And then we are iterating on top of the vertices. So as you can see here, the I is iterating on top of the uh, vertices of the graph. So let's say we have 100 vertices, we will do 100 loops. Then what do we do? We need to find out the number of neighbors for each one of the vertices, and we need to access the source um, data structure, right? So uh, using the source of I, we first find out how many neighbors does this vertex have. So then we need to iterate on top of the neighbors. We need to iterate on top of the neighbors. So <clears throat> when we iterate on top of each one of the neighbors, we first need to do two reads. So our first read was the source of i, right? So the next read was the weight. We need to read the weight at the edge, right? And as you can see, the edge uh, is a counter that uh, progresses over after its uh, nested loop. So 
I will say why this is important in, in the first question. The next one is the old drunk, which we access for every vertex. It depends on the eye. The next one that we need to read is the destination at the edge. And then the next one is the rank using the result of the destination at the edge, right? So as you can see, how many instructions do we have? Source, weight, old rank, destination, and rank. So we have five uh, memory accesses in total, right? So then the, the question gives us the number of the, um, the configuration of the system. So the system consists of a single core CPU and a single DRAM channel with four banks. All memory requests are served by DRAM. There are no caches in the system. Memory requests are serialized. What does that mean? Uh, the memory requests do not overlap and CPU stalls until data arrives. So everything depends on memory. The processor requests data from DRAM only to access these five data structures used in the application one. There is no memory access reordering. And what does that mean? The way I described how the accesses are happening, this is going to happen in DRAM. This is how the requests are going to be sent in DRAM. For example, here we access first source zero, weight zero, old rank zero, destination zero, and then the rank with the result of the destination zero. And yes, and we assume here that we have a single request for reading and writing to the, to the rank. So all the data structures are aligned at the start of a bank row. All the data structures are mapped in consecutive memory locations in each bank. If we have a four kilobyte DRAM row size, then the rank zero up to rank 1024, assuming that each element has four bytes, uh, is stored in row zero. Uh, the rank 1024 up to 2047 in, in row one, et cetera. So the latency of activating a row is 100 cycles. This will be needed with some calculations. Latency of reading the data from an activated row is 16 cycles. Latency of writing um, data to an activated row 20. Recharging 80. The DRAM bus width is four bytes. We send and receive four bytes. Yes, um, the latency of transferring these four bytes is four cycles, the latency of the bus. The row buffer size is two kilobytes with its bank size being 64 megabytes. The bank size here doesn't matter. It's like extremely big so that we don't have any issues with uh, data do not, that do not fit in the banks. Uh, we have an open page row buffer policy. Can someone remind me what's the open page row buffer policy? Or I can describe it. Okay. So the open page row buffer policy means that whenever we activate a row, we do not close it. The memory controller does not close the row. It doesn't pre-charge it. It's left open. So because we may, may have some locality, from the next access, and we might uh, hit in the next row when we access the next row. We have a first come, first serve scheduling policy, and all the DRAM bugs are initially precharged. So let's go to the first question. The first question says identify the memory access pattern. It's either random, irregular, which is random, irregular, strided, uh, or stream. Stream means we have a stride equals to one. Stride means we have a stride which is different than one. And random irregular means that we cannot describe whether it's stream or strided. For each one of the data structures used in the application, and we need to reason about the answer, right? So, does someone want to try? So, first we have the source. How many times is this, how is the source accessed? So, for every external loop, we iterate over i for all the vertices. We access source of i. So what's the data pattern for source? You can say. Correct. So the source is a stream. OK, then let's say the old rank. Correct, it's a stream. The weight, what is a stream? Oh, it is a stream. Yeah, it, is. it is a stream, yes. The destination? 
that depends on the edge is also a stream. And which is the key here? Then the problematic one, it's the rank. Because the rank depends on the value of the destination, right? So when, the, when there is this sort of dependency, the data dependency that loading a data structure depends on loading another one, it usually is a random uh, or irregular memory access, right? Because we depend on the values on the content of another data structure. Okay, so right now we're gonna study how, yes. You can say that in the application, like it's source, we access in the external loop source of zero, one, two, three, et cetera, right? The basic thing here is that for the rank, you, you explain why it is irregular or random because it depends on another data structure, okay? Um, the second question is about the memory interference, how these data structures interfere in the main memory. So we consider a case where the data structure rank and DST are mapped in bank zero. So we have bank zero here. We have four banks in the system, right? We have bank zero. And inside bank zero, we have rank and DST. So here it's rank and DST. Weight is mapped in bank one. So the full bank one has weight, I say W. Bank two has old rank. And bank three has source. It says right now, calculate the number of row buffer conflicts after executing up one using an input graph with two to the power of 19 vertices and two to the power of 22 edges. So first, what is row buffer conflict? You, everyone knows what that is. We all know what that is. So a row buffer conflict happens when we have an activated row. And for some reason, the memory controller sends a request and it needs to pre-charge this row and activate another row. This is called a conflict. Do not do the mistake of thinking that the conflict is a miss. It's not the same as a miss. Miss means that we have a pre-charged row and then we need to activate a row. This is a miss. This is not a conflict. So how do you do this calculation, right? So. The most, the most tricky part here is that the bank zero has rank and DST inside it. How many times will rank and DST be, be accessed? So DST will be, it's a stream, right? So, uh, and as we can see, the DST will be accessed once for every edge. So it will, act, it will be accessed two to the power of 22 times. And how many will the rank, uh, how many times will the rank be accessed? Same as the DST because it's accessed for every neighbor of every vertex, which means two to the power of 22 times. So we know for sure that this will be accessed two to the power of 22 times each. And we know that they're in the same bank. So we activate one row for one. And then what happens? We need to close it, access the other one, access the other data structure. And this happens interchangeably, as you show, as we showed before. We first. Um, we first access the DST zero and then the rank of DST zero. So in the next iteration, we, what do we need to access? DST one and then rank DST one. Yes. It's ac the edge is, is increased, right? Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah but it's, it's for every edge. So what will happen in this scenario in rank zero, right? We will need to do two to the power of 22 uh, conflicts when we access the destination and two to the power of 22 conflicts when we access the rank. So let's go to the weights in the other three scenarios, which have, it's, it's the same thing, it's in common. What's the difference here? We need to activate another row and have a conflict only when the row finishes. When that all finishes and we need to go to the next row, then we need to uh, activate another row, right? What does that depend on? The number of values we read from each row. Which is the number of values we read from each row? Each row is uh, two kilobytes. It's two kilobytes, and we read every time four bytes. So it's two to the power of eleven, 
divide by 2 to the power of 2, which is 2 to the power of 9. So every 2 to the power of 9 times, uh, for every 2 to the power of 9 reads, we need to have a row buffer conflict. And how many reads are we going to do? 2 to the power of um, 22 for the, let me see, 2 to the power of 22 for the weight. So 2 to the power of 22 reads for the weight divided by 2 to the power of 11, which is divided with 2 to the power of 2, which is 2 to the power of 22 divided by 2 to the power of uh, 9. Then for the, just for this one, uh, for the um, old rank, how many accesses do we need to do? We need to do less accesses here. We need to access it. This is a tricky one, I guess. It depends on the external loop. So we need to access it to the power of 19 times because it depends on the number of vertices, right? Yes, it's stored in a register, this one, for example, because in the internal loop, you use it, right? So it's 2 to the power of 19, again, divided by 2 to the power of 11, divided by 2 to the power of 2, because we have four byte values. And for the source, the source, we access it. Yes, 2 to the power of yes, 19, divided by 2 to the power of 11, divided by 2, second one. OK. So what is wrong here? Like, let's say that you give this answer. Why is this answer wrong? Because there is a small mistake in that. Like, if you leave it like this, there is a small mistake. This is a total access. That's correct. Can anyone think of the mistake? There needs to be a minus. OK. In the beginning, all the banks are precharged. So you don't have a conflict, right? So it's minus four. Okay, so don't be careful with these mistakes. <laughs> because we have four banks, all the banks are prepared in the beginning, so we don't have these four conflicts in the beginning. So let's go to the second question. Um, we need to calculate the number. Does anyone have any question on this? No, okay. We need to calculate the number of cycles that the processor stalls while waiting for data from memory when executing up one using an input graph, which is the same input graph to so the power of 19 vertices uh, to the power of 22 edges that leads to exactly two to the power of 20 row buffer conflicts. How are we going to think about that right now? <clears throat> so the way uh, I would do it is first what we need to calculate is the reads and the writes. That's the important part because how do we calculate the total formula? It's like conflicts. We pay a cost for the conflicts if there are, and then we need to pay the cost for the reads and the writes to the to the memory, right? So first we need to see how many uh, reads and writes uh, happening at the same time. So we have uh, reads and writes. So we have. 2 to the power of 22 for the rank, because it happens for every edge. We have 2 to the power of 22 for the DST. 2 to the power of 22 for the weight. 2 to the power of 22 for the old rank. And so here, for the old rank, if, if you uh, use the number 2 to the power of 19 of 2 to the power of 22, it doesn't matter. I will give the full points. I would give the full points because... Someone can say what Liana said, that there is a register, there is no register. So it's the same thing for me. It doesn't matter. Because even though uh, we access it using the same value for the internal loop, if someone says, OK, we'll use it to the power of 19 times, I would give the points. It's, it's the same thing. Mm. So to the power of 22 times for the old rank and to the power of 19 times for the source. So what happens during a row buffer conflict, right? So what is the formula? So the formula for calculating the cycles is first the cost of row buffer conflicts, how much time it takes to serve the row buffer conflicts. So we have row buffer conflicts multiplied by what? So we first need 
to pre-charge in a row buffer conflict, and then we need to activate a row because we have an open row policy, right? So it's uh, 80 plus 100 cycles, 80 for the pre-charge, 100 for the activate. Uh, and then in the case of a row miss, the only thing we need to do is we need to uh, activate the row. So we need to, yes? Ah, so we need to pay for 100 cycles. In the case of a miss, we need to pay for um, 100 cycles, yes. Okay, so, um, and then in the case of reads writes, how much time does it take to read and write the data from memory? If you read the, from the row buffer, if you read the uh, definitions in the beginning, it's uh, 16 cycles for the reads. So you have here, um, for the reads, for the reads, it's 16 cycles, right? Four. Why is this plus four? We need to read and then transfer the data, right? So we need four extra cycles. For the writes, how many do we need? 20 to write the data and four to transfer the data. 20 plus four. So the row buffers are given, it's to, the row buffer conflicts are given to the power of 20. The row buffer misses, it's four, the, the initial ones. So this equals four. The reads, we calculated them in the beginning and the writes, we also calculated them in the beginning. And you leave it like that. You don't need to do any calculation. I don't mind at all. Like I just need the formula so with all the numbers so that you can calculate the total number of cycles. Does anyone have any question? So have this in mind. It's usually this sort of question like you need to calculate the row buffer conflicts, row buffer misses, uh, latency for the reads, latency for the writes, and come up with the total latency. So for the um, uh, last question, it's a qualitative question. So the, um, we need to replace here the DRAM of the previously used system with two different DRAM devices, and DRAM, normal DRAM, and RL DRAM, reduced latency DRAM. Each one of these devices is connected to the processor using a separate channel. <laughs> and DRAM is the one that we used before. And uh, RL DRAM operates with half the internal latency for example, pre-charge, activate, read, write latencies are half of any DRAM, but has only one bank compared to the four banks of the previous DRAM. And it says here, given this system, how would you place the data structures of up one across N DRAM and RL DRAM to maximize performance? So given that the reduced latency DRAM has only one bank, which data structure would you place in that bank, assuming that the data structure fits inside the bank? Does anyone have any idea? You need to go back to the first question to figure this out. Yes? The correct, correct. The irregular access one, we know that it will incur many buffer conflicts, even if it's on its own inside the bank. So what we would like ideally is to access it with much lower latency. So what we would do, um, let's say that this is the processor, right? The core, let's say, and we have these two channels and here we have RL DRAM and here we have N DRAM. So here we would place the rank as correctly mentioned. We would send the request. We would have a benefit from a lower latency. And in the other four banks, we would place each one of the four data, the other four data structures of the application. Uh, which is okay. This is an easier, let's say, quality question. Does anyone have any questions on that? No. Okay, we can go to the prefetching question, which is the bonus. It's the last one. I mean, it doesn't matter that it's a bonus because you will get the points anyways if you solve it. So, no point of. So, this is also a qualitative question. There's no calculations that need to be done. You're designing a hardware prefetcher for a processor using reinforcement learning. If that brings something to your mind, there was a paper discussed during the course, which is called Pythia, published in Micro 2020 or 21, 21, I think. 
21. And for a memory request to the cast line address A, the prefetcher selects a prefetch offset, zero, O, let's say, and issues a prefetch memory request to the cast line address A plus O to the offset. Um, for every prefetch request, the memory hierarchy provides a numerical award R to the prefetcher that can take a value of the following three word reward levels. Accurate, signifying that the prefetch request was demanded by the processor indeed. Inaccurate, signifying that the prefetch request was not demanded by the prof, prof, processor. No prefetch, signifying that the prefetcher did not prefetch anything. In the initial configuration of the prefetcher, you set the values of the reward levels as follows. R equals 20, R in minus 4, R in P minus 10. What does that mean? If we do an accurate prefetch, we give a reward back. We say, okay, you did well. If you have an invalid uh, prefetch, inaccurate prefetch, then you re re reduce the score. And if you have a no prefetch, we are even more aggressive. We're like, why did you not prefetch? You need to prefetch. <laughs> Recall that the coverage of a prefetcher is defined as the fraction of a program's memory request correctly prefetched by the prefetcher. So coverage means that we have a bunch of memory requests and the prefetcher issues many things, many requests, or more than the memory requests that happen in the system. And we were able to cover the whole working set size of the application, a large part of the working set size of the application. And the accuracy, what does that mean? We prefetch something and it was indeed used. So, um, the, the accuracy is a different metric from the coverage. We might have a, probably if we have a really high coverage, we also have a high accuracy. But we have, might have a small coverage, but then also in high accuracy. There is no, there is a correlation, but it's not exactly the same thing. This is also defined in your lecture, I think, uh, for the prefetching lecture. So let's go to the questions. Which of the following statements, if any, are correct if you set the reward for not prefetching to 1,000 in the initial prefetcher configurations, given that all the other values, except uh, no prefetching, remain the same as the initial configuration. And there are multi multiple uh, choices which are correct here. First, the coverage of the prefetcher will significantly increase. The coverage of the prefetcher will significantly decrease. The prefetcher will start prefetching aggressively, and the accuracy of the prefetcher may increase. So if we give a reward to a no prefetch action, like we have three actions, right? We have two actions, basically. Either prefetch or not prefetch, right? We do not prefetch. And we give a reward of 1,000 compared to minus 4 and 20 for a no prefetch. Then which of these would happen? Is there a chance, for example, that we will have a higher coverage by prefetching less? If we give a higher reward for not prefetching, this means that our prefetcher will learn that, okay, if you don't prefetch, we're fine. Prefetch less, for sure. Is there a chance that the coverage will be higher? No, there is no chance that this will happen. Is there a chance that the coverage will significantly decrease? Yes, because we will prefetch less. We told the prefetcher, you didn't do a good job. Not prefetching was the best thing. So the coverage will decrease. The prefetcher will start prefetching aggressively. That's not possible because we're giving a feedback to the prefetcher that we're telling the prefetcher, hey, don't prefetch. And that's really good. And the last one, the accuracy of the prefetcher may increase. This is something you cannot be sure about, but it may indeed increase because you will prefetch less and your coverage might be less, but the requests you might send are, might be more accurate, right? You don't, you're not sure about this. So it's B and D the correct answer to these ones, because A and C are not possible. Does anyone have any questions on that? I guess it's quite simple, this one. Which of the following statements, if any are correct, if you set the invalid, the inaccurate prefetch to minus 500, so you have the, inval the inaccurate prefetch to minus 500, the no prefetch to minus 10, and the accurate prefetch to 20. Again, we need to do the same thing. So let's try to answer this here. So let's see. The prefetcher, the prefetcher will aggressively prefetch, even though the prefetches might be inaccurate. Is that possible? No. Why? Because we're telling the system, hey, you did inaccurate prefetches. 
And I'm going to punish you for that. Minus 500 points for Gryffindor. So it's like you cannot prefetch anymore inaccurately. And there is no chance that the prefetches which are inaccurate will uh, be uh, issued more. Why? Because the prefetcher is instructed not to prefetch aggressively. So A cannot be the case. The accuracy of the prefetcher will likely increase. Yes, the accuracy might increase because we're punishing a lot the inaccurate prefetching. So B. Did I? What, what did I do? Yeah. Maybe another question. I'm not sure. Try again. <laughs> <laughs> I was doing it. Maybe the inches, yeah. Why? Is there a reason? I don't know. I think we're looking at this one. Yeah, correct. But I think this one is not working. The pencil, not the. Um... It should work, yeah. So you owe me a pencil. <laughs> <laughs> me. I don't know what to do. That's fine. Can I use something else? No, I cannot use another pen, I guess, but. These are questions are qualitative, so I will just tell you the answers, okay? You can, yeah. It's easy. So the accuracy of the prefetcher will likely decrease. No, because we punish the inaccurate prefetches. There is no way that the accuracy will decrease. And the third one, the coverage of the prefetcher might increase or decrease. Are we sure about this? No. So it's possible. <laughs> so there is a chance that the coverage might increase or decrease. If we punish inaccurate prefetches, probably the prefetcher will learn to prefetch more accurately, right? There is a chance that their coverage might increase based on that or decrease. So again, the correct answers are B and D. And the last question, you want to make the prefetcher system aware <clears throat> by incorporating into the decision-making process the type of power source using the system. And you want to configure the prefetcher in the following way, the prefetcher should generate accurate prefetches whenever is possible, irrespective of whether the system is correct is connected to an external power adapter or running on a battery. So, if this is the case, which R value should be the highest? If we always want to be the most accurate possible, yes, which R value? Correct. So RA, which I cannot write on the right part, is the correct one and needs to be uh, the highest of all because we always want super accurate prefetches, right? So if the system is connected to an external power adapter, the prefetcher should continue to prefetch even if the prefetch might be inaccurate. So if this is the case, which one should it be in the second uh, branch here in the LCV where we have the external adapter? Which one should be higher, the no prefets or the inaccurate prefets? The inaccurate. Correct. Why? Because even though we might be inaccurate, we will prefets uh, aggressively <laughs> because we do not care about not prefets and we want to prefets as aggressively as possible. And if the system is running on battery, the prefetcher should prefer not to generate a prefets request if the prefets is likely to be inaccurate. So in this scenario, we do not want at all inaccurate prefetches. We want super accurate, as, th as stated in the beginning. We want no prefetches, the ne our next choice, and then we want the inaccurate ones, right? So the order would be here, it would be the uh, accurate, then it would be the um, uh, no prefetching, and then the inaccurate ones. Okay, uh, sorry for not being able to write, but I, I think you understand the solutions. And if someone has a question, uh, we can discuss it later and I can show you the full answer if you want. Okay. Okay, thanks a lot, Konstantinos. I think we can have a- Let's have a break to fix the- Yes, first. 10 minutes break. Thank you.
Apa yang bilang? I don't know.
Yeah, good. That was fun. Is it good? Okay. Yes, yes I can start. Okay. Uh, welcome back. We are going to start discussing emerging memory technologies. Bono is going to solve it. Uh, so the first type of like the 5.1 is like about true false questions and the answers are already given, but I would like to discuss why some of the answers are wrong. Uh, so the first one is data is written to a PCM by injecting current to change the magnetic polarity of the phase change material. So it's true that we inject current to change the phase change material, but we change the uh, like the optical reflexivity reflexivity instead of the magnetic polarity. And then S STT MRAM chain like is used to, is the technology that is like working by changing the magnetic polarity. So this one is, oops, is false. The second one is PCM can be denser than DRAM while DRAM is faster and more durable than PCM. And there's an opportunity to benefit from both P DRAM and PCM by building a hybrid DRAM PCM memory systems, which is true. Is I think like there was some papers explained in the lecture for that one. The third one is multi-level cell NVM has lower latency energy consumption than single level uh, NVM. And then in this one, both are actually raw. It requires both higher latency and higher energy consumption for that. Uh, the fourth one is NVM has lower endurance than DRAM because rise to NVM take much longer. So this is false, but it's also again partially correct because NVM has lower endurance, but the reason is not because uh, writes take much longer, but when you're writing, you just apply very really high temperature, so you destroy the cell structure a bit. And the fifth one is it takes the same energy to write 0, 0 as to write the 1, 1 into the multi-level cell PCM cell, which is wrong because 1,1 one, one has the like least resistance and then 0,0, zero has the highest resistance and you apply different temperature and then the, like the, the duration of the temperature is also different when you want to write these two different uh, values. Uh, so the second part is about like computing some things and this is like a long explanation that I will not go through all of it. But there are some important uh, numbers that you, you should take from here. The first one is we know that memory cell fails after 10 to the 7 writes, which is important to remember. And then the, it says that it has like a perfect way, way leveling scheme so that like writes are equally distributed. And then our goal is to estimate the lifetime of PCM, right? Uh, so what it says is that the student estimated already and then the lifetime is around three years. So it says three things about like how the instructions are executed. The, the first thing is that process is in order. There's no memory level parallelism and there is like write requests are fully serialized, meaning that your, all operations are fully serialized basically. And then it says like the total latency of a write is like sending memory requests from processor to memory controller, memory controller to PCM, and also write part of the PCM, which, uh, which is here. Uh, so we have like the total latency of one write is going to be the summation of these three numbers. And then it says like the read or write granularity is like 64 bytes. Oops. And then the, the last thing is that is it adopts a quad level a technique. So once we have all these results, like figured out, extracted from this explanation, we can solve the problem. So the problem is um, the question is asking for us to calculate the capacity of PCM that student uses. And it says like we can approximate three years by 10 to the 17 nanoseconds. So we know that we have to write uh, up to 10 to the seven writes to each cell for all cells to be worn out. And then we know that like uh, each write is going to be 64 byte granularity. So which is like uh, two to the nine bits. And then so the total number of writes you need is going to be 10 to the times, 10 to the seven times capacity over two to the nine, because each write is going to be write, like writing this much uh, por portion, of, portion of the um, 
the memory and then you need to write each portion of the memory that much time. And then the total write latency is uh, the, the three numbers we found above, which is like eight plus 13 plus 43, which is equal to 64 nanoseconds. So we know that the, the, the total duration is 10 to the uh, 17 nanosecond, which should be equal to the the kept the like the number of different number of memory positions that you should send writes to, which is a capacity over two to the nine bits. Oh, sorry, one more terrible writing, and then uh, the number of writes you should um, you should send for each position of the uh, memory, and then the time it requires for one write in total, which is sixty four nanosecond, and then you should solve for the capacity. Uh, which is going to be eight to the ten, eight times ten to the ten. Okay. Any questions? Guess that was clear. So the the next part is uh, is about like improving the lifetime of PCM cells, and we need to extract now our new numbers. It says like the um, cells endurance is uh, increased by a factor of ten, and then now we have not a multi level cell but like single level cell. It says like the, uh, lifetime is increased by two eggs. And then now the capacity of PC, I mean, like not single level cell mode, but quad level cell mode is eight gigabytes. And now we need to com compute the right latency of our new uh, PCM. So now, since the endurance is increased by a factor of 10, we know that the number of writes uh, we need to send for each cell is like 10 times 10 to the 7, which was the previous value. Now it's 10 to the 8. And then the memory capacity is reduced by 4 because compared to this one, because we are um, storing one bit instead of two bits in one cell, and like two bits means like four values. Um, so it's like the capacity is going to be uh, the capacity here over four. And then the required number of writes is going to be this times one over two to the nine as we calculated above because of the uh, 64 byte granularity of the writes. And then we, we know that like, let's say this value is X, the write latency is is like eight plus 13, which is like the time it requires from like to send a memory request from the CPU to memory controller and memory controller to PCM and plus the X value that we want to find. And then the new uh, lifetime of this PCM cells is equal to uh, the previous one times two, which is two times 10 to the seven. Now we need to just solve for this equation again, which is two times 10 to the 17 equals to this capacity or two to the 11 times 10 to the eight, which is like the number of writes plus the latency. And we know this one to be eight gigabytes. And then if we solve for the X in this equation, it's going to be something like two to the 12 times 10 to the nine over eight times 10 to the nine times eight minus 21. Okay, any questions? Okay, so now this is like the last part. And then here we have like a resistive memory. We store one matrix in this resistive memory and we have some inputs and we have some outputs, but we don't know one of the inputs. We don't know one of the outputs and we don't know one value of the matrix. And it explains how, in general, this mechanism works. So we, we convert these digital numbers to analog numbers, perform the multiplication, division, whatever the operation we want, and then we just like do this thing. So it says that uh, this this matrix part works by Kirchhoff laws, and then the basically you just have to remember whether you divide this input to this value stored or you have to multiply. And if you don't remember, you can just assume one, try to solve it with like whatever it is. And if you, if it's like wrong, that means you just assumed for the, the, the wrong one and you can just switch. But the correct thing is you should actually divide. And then if we divide, so we know that 
a over one times one over one times plus zero over zero point three plus uh, one over zero point five should be equal to four. And now that we know this one, this is two, then a should be one. So we solved for a, a is one. And since now we know a, Mm -hmm. We can solve for C because we know all the inputs and all the all the values stored and it's like C is equal to 1 over 1 plus 1 over 0 0.5 plus 0 over something plus uh, 1 over 0 0.2 which is equal to 1 plus 2 plus 5, 8. And then we also solve for C which is 8. Now we can solve for the next one which is b so we don't know the value stored here uh we can just try to like find the like the value here so 11 should be equal to 1 over 0 0.5 plus 1 over 0 0.2 plus 0 over something plus uh 1 over b that means 11 is equal to 2 plus 5 plus 0 plus 1 over b and then B should be 0 0.25 based on this thing. And I think that like, it's like the end of the emerging memory technologies questions. Do you have any questions? Nice, and just so. Thanks a lot, Manu. So the next question is about asymmetric multi-core systems that Nika is going to discuss it. Is it working now? Yes. Okay. Okay, so this question is uh, asymmetric multi-core. Uh, let's go over it. A, multi uh, a microprocessor manufacturer asks you to design a multi-core processor for modern workloads. You should optimize it, assuming a workload with 60% of its work in the parallel portion and 40% uh, in the serial portion. You are asked to compare two configurations that can fit into the processor's die area. First one is a small cores, SC, and the second one is large plus small cores, which would be LSC. So these um, two configurations consist of following. So SC is a design that contains eight uh, small cores, which share the same uh, die. Seven of these small cores operate at the baseline fixed instruction throughput, but the eighth small core is uh, an overclockable core, which can operate at either the baseline throughput or uh, the overclocked scenario with two times uh, the baseline throughput. Uh, and LSC is a design that contains one large core and four uh, small cores that all share the same die. The four small cores operate at the baseline throughput, and the large core is four times uh, faster than the small ones. Um, okay, in addition, table one provides the static power for when the core is idle and the dynamic power for when the core is active for each of these cores. So um, we see here, uh, let's take a look at the table. Um, for small cores, we have the two cases, baseline and overclocked. And then we have this large core. So it covers all the cases. We'll get back to this table when we need it. Uh, the SC processor, the first configuration, um, executes the parallel portion on all um, small cores. 
including the overclockable core operating at the baseline throughput. Uh, so that is when we have the parallel portion. And for the serial portion, it only uh, works on that overclockable core. But then based on the power budget we have, we can decide should it be baseline um, config of it or the overclocked um, config of it. Um, so that was for SC. Basically, this is a little bit important. Let me, uh, let's, uh, let us then um, underline it. So the SC processor executes on all the small cores and the serial portion only on the overclockable core using either baseline or overclockable options. Uh, and the LLC, uh, LSC processor executes the parallel portion only on the small cores and serial portion only on the large core. So, um, okay, the, these guys go only on the small one and the serial portion only on the large core. So these are important to uh, remember. Okay. Uh, which of these uh, following uh, three configurations, SC uh, and SC with overclocked um, core or L, uh, SC results in the highest performance and show your work. Okay, let's see how that will work. And then remember 60% of our um, application is happening in the parallel portion. So uh, for finding the speed up, let's say, so here um, for SC or where is the eraser? Uh -huh. Okay. So speed up for a C scenario would be something like this. Um, one, uh, so the parallel, the serial portion, it would run on the, um, that one core. So we would just have divided by one. So it's no way of accelerating it here. Uh, and for the parallel section, we have this divided by eight. So we um, here we can see, okay, um, this is three. So simplify it. Three here, forty. That will be something like this. Okay. So now go to the. Let's go to the uh, SC with overclock so the speed up would be again one here how much was this faster overclock two times okay and the parallel part does not change uh okay we want to do some publication here uh maybe or i can cheat alternatively Uh, and this one. So here uh, we have that big core that was four times faster. So now things are gonna be fast in this case. Um, but for here, we only have this four cores. And if we do calculations, uh, so this would be kind of like one here will be four, but then since we want to compare to other things, instead of writing four, we can write this. So um, uh, we would see that uh, this one is having the um, best performance because it's having the highest speed up this config. Okay, now let's go see what happens next. Uh, so we did uh, some analysis for performance. Now we want to do some analysis for the energy consumption because it should be also a metric of reference in your design. Which of the three design configurations, SC, uh, SC with overclock core or LSC result in the lowest energy consumption show your work. 
So here we have the power values. So we need to see how much of the um, time is spent in whatever configuration. So we would multiply the time by power to have um, some uh, analysis of energy in that case. Uh, let's uh, go remember some, some things. So here, when the small cores are idle, uh, they have um, this much static power uh, when they are active, uh, this value. So maybe I can have the paper version of it here in front of me so that I, I uh, because an iPad is a little bit difficult to switch the pages in this case, but remember uh, somehow these values. Okay. Uh, so we, when we want to find the total energy, we need to find the energy spent on the serial portion and energy spent on uh, the parallel portion. Uh, and uh, so we know the ratio of time spent on the serial portion and the parallel portion um, in these parts, right? For example, here, um, 0 0.6 divided by eight, um, let's say could be the parallel part, whereas relatively 0 0.4 could be the serial part. Um, so if you have the paper, you can like flip it easily and check it and uh, quickly do the calculations in this case. So let's find uh, energy consumption for the serial case. Um, okay, sorry, for the SC case. Uh, when we are doing the uh, serial portion of that application, we have um, that core, the normal core, which is in this baseline config um, using one. Here, that's the power. But the seven other cores, they are idle, right? So then we would have this case. So how much of the time was uh, spent on the serial part? Uh, 0 0.4. So I do this one a little bit like in more detail than the other ones would be um, a lot more clear, right? Uh, and when we do the dynamic part, all the cores are active. So all eight of them are going to use one. And how much was the amount of time um, spent on uh, this part? It was, uh, let's say three multiplied by 40, uh, divided by 40, right? Uh, basically this number. Okay. So let me uh, quickly go for the SC overclockable scenario. So the overclockable one makes uh, this part uh, faster relatively, right? Um, because it's uh, twice as fast. So, and then we have here, Let's go one by one. Okay, when it is, um, again, we have these things idle and the power is um, eight. Okay, now let's go. Uh, when this overclocked one is idle, it is, um, no, 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 sorry, because now it is acting just like a normal core uh, for the parallel section. So we just do eight multiplied by one. And the ratio of time spent on the parallel section, again, is the same um, here, as you see. Okay. Uh, let's see what happens here. So in this part, we have uh, this thing running this bigger core four plus, but we had four small cores in this case. So we have four multiplied by five, 0 0.5, and this would be um, 1.10, sorry, 0 0.1. Uh, okay. And here, this thing, when it is, static two plus uh, those four things being active, right? Those four cores use one and the time they take is uh, this. It should be. Okay, so now in this phase, again, I cheat so that 
we go a little bit faster, but these calculations are very small, as, uh, very easy as you see, it's like uh, really round numbers. So quickly, we find these. Okay, which one is uh, consuming small, uh, smallest amount of energy? It would be this one relative to the other two. Okay, now let's see. So the question is asking at least what ratio of a workload should be spent on the parallel section so that the SC configuration, even without overclocking, performs better than the LSC configuration for your work. So the SC configuration had a lot of small cores, uh, whereas the LSC configuration had a bulky core to accelerate the um, serial uh, portion of the application. So for the parallel portion, we would have a smaller number of cores uh, relatively. Um, and we want to see that uh, how parallel, how big should the uh, parallel portion of the application be? Yes. Hmm? Mm -hmm. um, so like maybe we take a power time. Mm -hmm. And so like if you're using zero plus four as your time, is the actual time or is that like the relative time? So these energies so that's not actual energy in watts or fuel. It's like two point four times some constant. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, relative. Yeah, because you are doing uh, we are uh, basically finding relative times in that case. Okay. okay. So for this part, um, yeah, basically we want to see how big the parallel portion of the application should be um, for uh, us to have a C configuration in our system instead of L LSC. So uh, let's just uh, have a parameterized scenario. So if we have, uh, let's call the parallel portion of our application P. So what we want is that um, one minus P divided by one plus parallel portion divided by eight. So this is speed up. We want it to be bigger than um, one minus P divided by four because that was, that was what the larger core was doing. And then P would be four. So then we do a little bit of calculations. One minus P plus P8 here, one minus P. So uh, these things go away with each other. Uh, so here we have one minus uh, seven eighths of P less than I mean, wait, one of course. Am I being correct? Wait, eight, oh no. Here, so wait. Okay, I'm having uh, elementary school issues right now, which we will resolve. Uh, so here we have, and let's multiply everywhere for eight. Okay, so these guys went away. We have here two. We multiply these things by eight. So this is P. Uh, okay. So let's bring seven P here and six, right? Oh, I did it correctly. <laughs> right. So, yeah, it's a stage fright otherwise. <laughs> I would say I do this much faster. So, okay, uh, in order to improve the performance of the LSC configuration. Uh, so, okay, we realized here that if our application is really parallel, uh, the uh, LSC configuration actually does not perform really well. Well, then we think, okay, let's uh, improve its performance. What can we do? Um, so in order to improve the performance of the LSC configuration, uh, we come up with uh, hardware design optimizations to improve the throughput of this large core. 
and we expect that these optimizations will increase the throughput of the large core by t times. Uh, and uh, so we um, improve this and we want to see, okay, if your application is really parallel, let's say it has 90% of its work in the parallel section, can we actually have a LSC configuration to outperform the SC configuration with overclocking? And if yes, how uh, much should we speed up our core? Okay, uh, then it, this is like very uh, simple again. It just needs, uh, after this point, just some arithmetic simple uh, operations to be done. So uh, how would we want the uh, speed up for uh, uh, SC with overclocking? to be smaller than a speed up of LSC configuration, right? Here, then that means we would have one. Uh, so here we have one ten. Uh, one tenth of it is two times here. Uh, divided by eight, right? Um, this should be smaller than one, okay. We had already four times it was faster, then we multiply it by T um, plus 0 0.9, this part does not become faster. Then again, whoops, sorry. And again, we do some small things. Okay, it is, let's make everything 80. Um, uh, okay. Four divided by eighty plus nine divided by eighty, and here I would have uh, two divided by eighty t plus eighteen divided by eighty. Right. So uh, this thing goes away from here and there, and. Um, in the end, let me see. So, somehow 13 uh, should be more than uh, 2t plus 18, right? Which means that 13. So, Wait, actually, we don't need to do some more. Uh, this just doesn't happen, right? It just wouldn't work for any positive value of T. So the question was, is it possible? And no, it's not possible. Yeah. Then questions? Okay. Oh. Okay. Oh, no, Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. So we are going to be soon run out of time, but I'm going to quickly also discuss this question, the interconnection networks. So, So in this question, we have uh, 16 processors and we are connecting them in two different topologies. The first one is uh, for, cross, for mesh and the second one is troughs. So I guess you are aware of these two topologies um, in the 
from Professor Mutu's uh, lectures. So we are going to design uh, some routing algorithms for these two topologies. In order to define the routing algorithms, we here we just we define them based on the turns that they are prohibited for packets to take. So we can have uh, eight different turns in a 2D mesh or 2D trust network. So if you consider clockwise, we can have uh, north, east. Yeah. We can have north, east, east, south, southwest, and west, north turns. And for counterclockwise also, we have uh, four different turns as well. So here we have three router, uh, routing algorithms. The first one, we are saying that turns north, east, Southwest, Northwest, and Southeast are forbidden. The others four turns are allowed. So the, the easy way to understand this routing algorithm is to understand the basically concept, concept of this routing. So when we don't have North East turn, and when we don't have let's say Southwest, it means that it's impossible that we go in Y direction and then we want to turn to X, right? Also for the counterclockwise terms, when we don't have Northwest and Southeast, it is impossible that we go in Y direction and then take X. So which means that this routing algorithm is simply X, Y routing or dimension order routing. So for the routing algorithm two, uh, only two terms are for, forbidden. Uh, terms Southwest and Northwest. So Southwest is from in the, in the clockwise circle, we don't have Southwest. And in the counterclockwise circle, we don't have Northwest term. So here also, you can imagine how this routing algorithm looks like. So I don't know why it's not good. Okay, so when we don't have a southwest and northwest, it means that it's impossible that we go south or west, sorry, south or north, and then we want to turn to west. In other words, if our destination is in the west of the network, we first need to go completely west. And at some point when we are done with the west part, we can go north or south. But if the destination in the east of the network, then basically you can do whatever you want. So this routing algorithm meaning that if, if the destination from west, so to west, it is actually, you can consider it as X, Y routing. But if you are going to east, the routing is actually fully adaptive. Is that clear? Okay. And the third routing algorithm turns west, north, and north, west are forbidden. So west, north here, and north, west. So this one is a bit hard to deal with, I mean, to understand how, what does it look like. Basically, in order to understand it, you just need to make sure that you don't take these terms. I'm not going to interfere this uh, routing algorithm to any of uh, easy, understandable routing algorithm. Okay. So, 
The first part, we are going to basically write some paths. So we have uh, two different this source destination pairs from processor five to processor 11. Oh, also recall that uh, these uh, routing algorithms, they should be minimal routing. Do you know what does it mean, minimal routing algorithm? Which means that we need to take the minimal number of hops from the source to the destination. It is important actually to consider. Okay. So basically here, we want, what we want to say for 2D mesh network, for example, if you want to go from processor five to processor 11, using algorithm one, basically what should be the path? So we already know that algorithm one is uh, X, Y routing. So processor five to 11, the path should be P5, P6, P7, and P11. Okay, sounds easy. I'm going to skip the next one also. So for the for algorithm two, P5 to P11. So P5 to P11. So P11 is in the east part compared to P5, right? So we can basically go there in a fully adaptive way. So what are the different paths? One path is P5, P6, P7, P11. The other path could be P5, P6. P10 and then P11. And another pass could be P5, P9, P10, P11. These are the only three minimal paths that we can take. However, for the second one, which is P5 to P12, P5 to P12, because P12 is in the west part, I mean, come with respect to P5, we are uh, we need to consider only dimension order routing. So we go P5, P4, P8, and P12. Is that clear? Okay. So let's also do one for algorithm three. P5 to P11. I'm also going to cheat. Okay. Yeah. So P5 to P11, the only thing we need to be worry about is uh, taking turns west, north, and north, west. So since P5 to P11, we are actually going to the east part of the network, right? So it's completely fully adaptive. So the answer would be the same as the routing algorithm two. However, from P5 to P12, which is the second part of this question, since we are going to the, uh, to the west of the network, we may take west, north, or north, west. Are we really taking the, those terms? No, because P12 is actually, with respect to P5, is in the south of the network. So if you want to go minimal pass, basically, you won't take any uh, west-north or north-west passes. Okay, sounds good. So for the Toros, uh, is a bit, I would say, a bit harder. So for the first one, P5 to P11, we can, uh, again, we can have this P5, P6, P7, and P11 again. But there should be also another way. We can go this way, basically P5, P4, and then take the wraparound link to P7, and then go south. P5, P6, uh, for, the, for the first algorithm, no, because the first algorithm is um, XY. 
right? So we cannot take we cannot take uh, east south turn, right? Because No, no, we can we can take actually east south turn, but we cannot take south east because in the end you need to also take a south east turn, right? That is forbidden. Okay. So I'm not going to explain more for the first part of this question because I guess you can see them from the solution. I mean, the hardest uh, part for this 2D throws, if I remember correctly, was this P5 to P11, that we have six different passes. So, and I remember that many students, they just uh, wrote two or three passes or four passes, so they couldn't be comp comprehensive enough for this one. Okay. So, the next... The next part of this question is about uh, deadlock free. So I guess you are all aware of the deadlock. Basically, whenever you have some circular dependence in your network and packets cannot be proceed anymore, we are in deadlock position. So we are asking that uh, basically each of about uh, for each topology and each routing algorithm, you need to prove that it is deadlock free or deadlock can happen. So if the deadlock is if if the algorithm is deadlock free, you need to prove it. Or if you are saying that this algorithm is not deadlock free, you just need to provide an example that deadlock can happen. So for the routing algorithm one, we know that it is x y. From the course, also you know that x y is deadlock free. But if you want to um, basically prove that, also that would be easy. Let's take a look at this. So usually if you want to prove that an algorithm is deadlock free, we can uh, use uh, contradiction. So we consider that we have deadlock. If we have a deadlock, we, so it means that we have a circle. And that circle could be clockwise or counterclockwise, right? Consider that I mean, without loss of generality, we can consider that circle is clockwise. So if the circle is clockwise, there should be the, the rightmost link, right? The, not link, I mean, uh, the rightmost edge of this circle. So if you have a, the rightmost edge, at some point, you should have some turn from west to south and south to east because the rightmost edge there should be some turn like this do you agree so in algorithm one we don't have um yeah we don't have south we don't have southwest, right? So southwest is forbidden, which means that we cannot have that rightmost edge in a uh, clockwise uh, orders. And for the counterclockwise order also is similar. You just need to consider the leftmost uh, edge. Is that clear for you? Okay. Any Okay, yeah, I mean, the, the answer, if you write something like that would be enough, but if you want me to explain more. So basically, uh, let's see, actually, I guess after uh, explanation of routing algorithms three, uh, that would be more clear because, no, I can explain also here. Okay, so whenever we have a deadlock, it means that there are some packets that they are waiting for each other. For example, P1, processor P1, is sending packet to P3. 
processor tree is sending packet to um, to P6, for example. Sorry, processor one is sending to P3, P2 is sending to, for example, P7. P3 wants also to send something to P6. P7 is sending to P5. And for example, P5 is sending to P2. I mean, there should be a circular, you know, accesses. And you, you should also know that the probability of that deadlock is not that high because, but when we are saying that this algorithm is deadlock free, which means that it is impossible that deadlock happen. But some algorithms deadlock can happen with some probability. So if all of these transactions, which I mentioned here, all the packets, they inject, they are injected at the same time together, then we would have deadlock. So, so you see that I'm thinking of circular accesses. So whenever you have a circular uh, request, it means that there should be some packets that they are taking the rightmost edge. If we are thinking of um, clockwise circuit, I mean, for the counterclockwise is also the proof is the same. So yeah, for the clockwise, there should be the rightmost edge. And for the rightmost edge, for sure, some packets needs to take east south term and some packet is also taking south west term otherwise we wouldn't have that circular right so since uh, in in routing algorithm one we don't have south west term then for sure we don't have this term which means that we cannot have the rightmost link and then the contradiction is false. It's clear now? Okay. So for the routing algorithm two, the proof is exactly the same because we cannot have again southwest term. Okay. So you 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 are you are using the southwest term for um, proving that the deadlock can not happen in um, in clockwise order. And northwest for counterclockwise. Okay. Here we can for counterclockwise, we can also consider the rightmost link, rightmost edge in that circle. Okay, and that's all. So for routing algorithm three, actually, so that was also the hardest part, I would say. The deadlock can happen. So here we are, I'm providing an example that, so there are eight packets with the following sources and destination. P1 is sending to P6. Cannot show them together. So P1 is sending to P6. P1 to P6, P2 to P5. Basically, I'm considering how many hops between them, uh, like three hops, right? So P1 wants to send to P6, P2 to P5, P5 to P8. I mean, the circle of this, uh, let me explain it a bit differently because it's a bit hard. Now I understand why this question was hard. <laughs> okay, now I'm just kidding. So uh, for the routing algorithm three, turns west north and north west are forbidden. So if you pay attention to the proof that I provide just before. I was thinking of rightmost link, rightmost edge, and to not happen. 
So here, since we have, we can have actually in the, in the counterclockwise, in, in the clockwise, we can have the rightmost edge, right? Because both east, south, and uh, southwest are allowed. So we can have that. But for the counterclockwise, West North is yeah sorry so North West North West is forbidden so for the counterclockwise we cannot have the the rightmost edge but the thing is that the combination of the load link that we have they can make a circle. You know, here, if you check this one, actually, we have this figure in the lecture. Because of that, actually, we designed it like that, by, by the way. So we can have this turn. And then this turn is also allowed. This turn is also allowed. But then you don't need to go up, because go up is forbidden. But you can continue and then go down and then turn uh, to east and turn up to north, and then you made a circle. So the circle in algorithm, routing algorithm three is a bit complex, but can happen because the combination of the uh, terms that they are allowed, they can make a circle. Yeah, because we had that picture in the lecture, because otherwise, I mean, yeah, yes, I agree. But yeah, anyway, I mean, this semester interconnect question would be much easier. And yeah, <laughs> don't worry about that. Okay. Sure. So, yeah, because... Uh, I mean, there is no, for a specific uh, routing algorithm two, because the terms that they are forbidden is southwest and northwest, and they are contributing to the basically rightmost edge. No, because, no, I'm considering that because I want to make a proof, right? I'm saying that if we have a circle, I mean, that's the hint, right? from the, the terms that they are forbidden. So since here, Southwest and Northwest are forbidden, I can see that they are in the rightmost part. But for example, for XY, for the XY, uh, because Northeast and Southeast are also forbidden, you can prove with the leftmost edge. Okay. So, uh, so the answer for trust network is actually very easy because uh, all of them has deadlock. <laughs> so, so in trust network, we have topology has a circle, right? So if we have only use also X, Y routing. Consider that in this example, let me actually find the, yeah. So yeah, consider that P0 wants to send to P2, P0 to P2, P1 to P3, and then P2, to P0, okay? And P3 to P1. These four packets, they make a circle. Even though we have X, Y routing, because the, the topology has a circle, all of them, they can wait for each other and provide deadlock. And since X, Y has deadlock, for sure, routing algorithm two has deadlock as well because routing algorithm two is less constraint compared to 
routing algorithm one. And for routing algorithm three, since we already proved that it has deadlock in mesh, then for sure for throws is also has deadlock. Okay. And the last part of this question is basically you want to select an appropriate routing algorithm for your topology, which is could be mesh or throws. So the constraint that you want is that the routing algorithm should be deadlock free and also should not be deterministic. What does deterministic mean? The routing algorithm, which is deterministic, means that it always takes this, there is only one pass from the source to the destination. So for the 2D mesh, there are two algorithms that they are deadlock free, routing algorithm one and two. The routing, routing algorithm one, because it's XY routing, we know that XY is deterministic routing because no matter about uh, which source and destination you're selecting, there should be only one pass, okay? So a routing algorithm one is deadlock free, but deterministic. However, routing algorithm two, we know that if you want to go to the east part of the network, we can make it considered as a fully adaptive. So there are, which can utilize the past diversity. So basically the answer would be routing algorithm two for the mesh net network. And for the trust network, basically none of them because none of them are deadlock free. For trust, uh, yes. Um, basically, I guess in, in the in Professor Mutulu's lecture, uh, you learn that a, one of the job for virtual channels is to also avoid deadlock. So we can add virtual channels to to the topology to the network and uh, break the deadlock cycle. The other way is that make it more constrained. So for these three algorithms that I mentioned, the constraints are not enough to avoid deadlock. But if we, there are some actually risk papers in the past that they show that if we add more constraint to Toros, I mean, to the routing algorithm, which is for Toros, we can make it also deadlock free, but you don't need to, I mean, know them basically. <laughs> If you are um, interested, you can send me an email and I will share with you uh, some material. Yeah. Okay, that's all. But uh, yeah, uh, for for sure, <laughs> this semester uh, interconnect question would be easier. So don't worry much about this one. Okay, thanks a lot. I think uh, we are done. Yeah, and wish you all the best for, for the exam next Thursday. Thank you.